Hey everybody, before we get into today's episode, I'm just going to drop this and let you know really quickly, this episode is going to be a little different from what we normally do. There is going to be, it's basically just encompassing one story, one missing 411 story about one man, three different stories from three different witnesses, how they encountered it, heard about it, all about the same story, as well as a uh, analysis kind of at the end um, from a local in the area and what they're thoughts are on on the case itself and what they think happened truly happened and uh as well as some other random far-fetched theories that could potentially be it depending on what you believe in so just want to give that precursor uh let you know that uh, i really hope you enjoy this because i'd like to do a lot more of these in the future or just integrate these along with the regular let's not meet stories like that whatever you want to call it so i'll shut up like i need to like i normally do let's get into the story Missing 411, otherwise known as the Can-Am Project, is the first comprehensive data collection of missing person cases, specifically located within the national park areas. This project was originally spearheaded by David Pilates, a police officer turned investigator. A tip from a park ranger turned Pilates onto the idea that there could be a connection between the thousands of people that go missing every year, not just in one park, but all of them. He's since compiled a staggering amount of cases that all share eerily similar details. Pilates still acts as the head researcher, but the missing 411 phenomenon has taken on a life of its own now. Curious minds all over the country have taken up the mantle to try to piece together some of the most mind-boggling mysteries we can imagine. In 1995, my wife and I took a holiday weekend into the back country of Arizona. We followed the Beeline Highway through the desert and up into the mountains, where bristling pine and oak trees rolled out as far as the eye could see. My wife and I liked camping, hiking, all the fair weather outdoor activities. Being from Phoenix, we weren't familiar with a lot of the high country, but we knew some areas in the Mogollon Mountains that would be perfect. These spots were pretty rural, all things considered but still got a lot of use out of the tourist. We found a place around Forest Road 300, which is a local hotspot for all the outdoorsy types. It's a dirt road that stretches from one side of the mountain range all the way to Highway 260 on the other side. It's a major access point for many of the ponds, lakes, and lookout spots throughout the rim. Again, it's rural by definition. It's a dirt road to the mountain range, but at the end of the day, it isn't a common place for someone to get lost. There's tons of campers and hikers along this road. So even if you were a little deep on a trail hike, there would be still someone within a mile or two of you. My wife and I never believed we'd be in the vicinity of where a person would go missing forever. The weekend itself was ideal. Great temperatures, great climate, not too overcrowded. We got to do everything that we planned on and just lounged around camp on that infamous Sunday morning. We could hear it at first, rumbling way far off. Then other camps around us started buzzing with talk. We weren't sure what, but we knew something was going on. Sure enough, it came tearing down the 300 road, a huge stock white semi with a full trailer behind it, 18 wheels of chaos, and it's far from anywhere it should be. The nearest highway is 30 miles away, maybe even more. The nearest paved road is just as far. There's nowhere to turn around. My wife and I sat in our camping chairs in pure shock as this thing rolled on by. We couldn't believe it. People started to gather, mostly the surrounding campers and hikers that saw it come through. Everyone was saying the same thing, that it was crazy he was trying to drive through here. After a while, we realized we could still hear the engine, and we started walking down the road. We were all talking about the possibilities. The general consensus was it had to be stolen or at the very least a hijacking. There wasn't a scenario that made sense wherein this trucker would take a dirt road to a mountain pass. A few of the more reserved said maybe it had to do with drugs or simply bad directions. 
We didn't go for more than 10 minutes before the semi comes barreling back in our direction. At this point, people start running back into the trees or back down the road. Something is clearly wrong. I'll never forget how fast he sped by us and his emotionless face behind the windshield. He looked vacant, soulless, like there wasn't any thought to what he was doing. No reaction. Those of us that remained just got out of the way, cleared to either side of the road. And it was a good thing too, because this guy didn't slow down or try to clear us at all. He didn't even look at us. And on top of that, we could see that he was alone in the cab. I guess there could have been a person hiding behind him where the sleeping space is, but he looked alone to me. He barreled back the way he came and disappeared from sight. My wife and I hurried after him, worried he'd get panicky and start running campsites over, and we weren't that far off. When we got back to the dispersed camping area, others were talking and milling around. They said the truck kept going back down the way it came, but somehow got off the road and stalled in a field. He went on. The guy emerged from the cab and wandered around the area for a bit. He was definitely by himself, and he was muttering about how they made him do it, and why did he listen to them. What stuck out to my wife and I was that he allegedly said, I'm going to jail now, when he stumbled around that field. That told us he had some kind of awareness, you know? It wasn't just mindless, crazy, agitated driving. He wasn't definitely being held against his will either. It was just a random act of chaos, or so my wife was inclined to believe. She asked the man we were speaking to if he had any luck getting the vehicle unstuck or what the plan of action was. No one knows where he is, came the response. I can honestly tell you I've never felt more uncomfortable in a single moment. This guy was driving batshit crazy around the mountainside and then just abandons a semi in the middle of the woods. It's gotten even crazier. Yeah, the guy went on. He drove his truck right through someone's camp, got the semi stuck and then wandered off into the woods. That was a very chilling development. My wife and I slowly turned at one another, eyes wide with horror. Our camp lay down the road for just a few hundred feet and somewhat out in the woods a maniac was skulking around. I didn't like the idea of being in some flimsy nylon with a deranged person so close to us. As more people heard about what was going on, we watched them literally pack up and leave right then and there. Others stuck around, out of curiosity or sheer determination to see their weekend through. I couldn't be sure. My wife and I were curious and decided to stick around. Like most Arizona natives, we were packing a gun like usual. The sheriff showed up later in the afternoon as word got around the mountainside. This was pre-cell phone, though someone would have had to go back to town to make a report. We heard the sheriff say he honestly heard a rumor and was just coming to check it out. He got the cab of the semi open, as it had been locked. It was totally intact, clean, organized. No sign of struggle or any drug use. It didn't even smell like cigarette smoke, and smoking was common for a trucker in the 90s. The sheriff said that he was convinced this guy was clean, even had all the proper insurance and paperwork in the glove box. He ventured the idea that maybe this guy had simply had an episode, gone a little crazy and just went off course. Then he went around back and jimmied the trailer door open. We were bewildered to see pallet after pallet of strawberries and fresh lettuce. It was a cold box trailer, so it held a certain temperature, had a vent system the whole nine yards. This really turned the sheriff on his head. He must have been expecting a legal cargo of some kind, but again, only found straight lace evidence. He was stumped. For a trucker to walk away from his cargo was one thing, but to leave behind his truck and expensive trailer, whoever this person was abandoned their entire livelihood out there in the Tonto wilderness. He started getting statements from everyone in the area. A couple of groups made reports that this renegade truck driver literally barreled right through their campsite ran over some of their belongings too. Another couple came forward and said that they were driving down 300 Road when the semi came roaring at them. They stopped thinking the big rig would do the same, but soon realized this truck wasn't going to slow down at all. They proceeded to throw the car in reverse and speed backwards in an effort to get away. Fortunately, they found a small turnout and just managed to get out of his way before he ran them over too. It was a true wonder this guy hadn't killed anybody. My wife and I finished out the day with little else to report. 
the sheriff deputies were in and out of the area throughout the afternoon. And of course, a wrecker came up to take a look at the truck to see if he could even be towed out. The truck and the trailer remained that night, ominous throughout the trees. We think the sheriff wanted the truck left in place, almost like a lure. Maybe this guy would regain a little coherence and come back to his truck. To my knowledge, no one ever saw him again. My wife saw the story pop up on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries or some such show, and the details were uncanny. We learned the guy's name was Devin. He had a family back in Kansas, a mortgage. He was exactly what the sheriff pegged him for that day, a totally normal, average Joe. We still wonder why he went off the rails that day, because the program had very little in the way of answers. I planned to hike along the Buck Springs in the summer of 1995, long before the disappearance of Devin Williams, the trucker who went into the woods. I hadn't even heard the story until I got into Payson and stopped to gas up my truck. The clerk at the counter asked me if I was in town to help find the missing maniac. Intrigued, I asked what they were talking about, and I'll never forget the clerk's face. She was just overjoyed to meet someone who hadn't heard the story yet. She went on at length. A man named Devin Williams had taken his big rig and trailer off the highway onto Forest Road 300. This was a familiar area to me, and the thought of an 18-wheeler trying to navigate the skinny hairpin turns of that road was insane. It wasn't possible, to which the clerk nodded. She explained that he got the rig stuck and no one had seen him since. He disappeared over Memorial Weekend, and I was rolling into town on Tuesday, just 48 hours after he vanished. I know it sounds crazy, but my life went on. I didn't really give it any more thought as I rolled up the mountain and towards the trailhead. It wasn't until I hit 300 Road that I started seeing search and rescue flagging neon vests out in the woodland. They were actually looking for someone. I was expecting to get stopped by local law enforcement, but that never happened. What looked like a checkpoint was really just a surveillance point along the road, keeping an eye on people in the area. Once I got to the trailhead, I started prepping for my day hike. I got even more information. Had I kept driving along 300, I would have come upon the truck and the trailer itself, apparently left mirrored in a field due to mud. Flatlands in the area are notorious for holding standing water for days and days on end. All of this was relayed to me by a couple in the parking lot who showed up because of the missing person case. They were keen to help find Devin Williams as he'd been reported missing the morning prior. The license plate, the truck, it all belonged to this Devon fellow. He was a cross-country trucker out of Kansas. The couple went on and on. They said apparently the driver got his rig stalled. He wandered around the field for an hour or two, talking to himself. He was saying over and over that someone made him drive out there, and now he was going to jail. This made me scratch my head as it added a whole layer of extra to whatever mystery was at hand. That being said, the campers in the area that weekend said no one else ever got out of the truck, so as to who could have made Devin do this, I couldn't tell you. Again, I left all of this back at the parking lot and just started my hike. I was leaving from Barbershop Trailhead and moved north through the forest. After ascending a steady incline, I would start splintering off to the east to get to Buck Springs area, which is more isolated than the other locations. It's rugged and there isn't room for vehicles, so the only people I would encounter would likely be on foot. I planned this trip on purpose though, since it was a couple of days after Memorial Weekend. The place was pretty much empty. All the weekenders had already packed up, so there wasn't many cars in the parking lot. I'd seen more search and rescue operators than anyone else, and even then they weren't combing back this far from the truck yet. Little did they know that they should have been. I made it about three miles before coming up on a highline trail and cresting a ridge. The lookout was beautiful, so I decided to take a moment and relax in the shade for a bit. I broke out the lunch that I packed, kicked my feet out beneath a towering pine tree, and just soaked it all in. Missing person or not, this is exactly what I was looking for. Somewhere in the distance, I could hear a helicopter making laps. After eating a snack, I relaced my boots and started pushing into the Buck Springs area. I was coming in from the west side, so opposite from the cabin trailhead area. I was making the rugged, rural ascent, not using the road like other people usually do. 
It afforded much better views and isolation. It also made for great shed hunting, which is a pastime of mine. I look for discarded antlers from both deer and elk in the off seasons. After another hour or two and navigating some crazy up and down ravines, I called it quits. It had been a four hour jaunt back to the truck and it was starting to press into the afternoon. I got reoriented, crunched the little time and energy that it would take me to get back and decided to reroute my course a bit. It'd be faster if I took the more traveled trails back to the parking lot. I sensed my gear up, started hoofing it due south instead of west, the way I came. Due south of me, there was a couple of things. The 300 road, for starters, but also more wild up and down terrain, unending forestry, and the SAR operators. There were also some dispersed campgrounds, a cow pond, and somewhere, the big empty big rig, nestled in that muddy field. As I was making my way back, I let my mind wander a bit and thought about what could have happened. Everyone was so keen to say that foul play was the answer, but my gut feeling was drugs or some kind of mental illness, especially after hearing those final details. He was manic, simply out of his mind, had a touch of psychosis, and explains almost all the other behaviors. As I was walking along, thinking about that guy, I looked up and took in the area. I was going to need to turn hard west soon, whenever I felt like I was getting even with the trailhead area. As I'm looking around, something catches my eye between the branches. I do a double take and start to slow down. It looks like fabric hanging from the tree. As I squint and really take it in, I see boots, a frame, hands. I see eyes looking right back at me. I came to a dead stop, deer in headlights type of thing. I try to discern who or what I'm looking at, but there's too much in the way. Pine needles and branches, the place was thick with it. I turned to face them and started creeping over. Hello? I said loud and deep. My stomach felt crazy, all of me did. It took me a few steps to realize that I was holding my breath and I'm about to make myself pass out. The adrenaline wasn't having a good effect on me. No response, but I was getting closer and I could see that it was a man. I don't know how else to say it, but he was obviously the missing man. He literally looked like the stereotypical trucker. A little bit of a belly, mustache, jeans. Hey, are you all right? I asked. Are you Devin? Still no response. I step into the clearing where he's standing, and now I can see that something's really wrong with him. First off, he's dirty as hell. His feet are bare of any shoes or socks. Somehow they look fine, when in reality, this was a treacherous area with lots of rocks and underbrush. I expected them to be swollen or cut to ribbons. There are some scratches on his face, probably from the branches, but it could be his own doing, I guess. He had jeans on, a black t-shirt, but one of his arms was through the head hole instead of the armhole, so it was pulled kind of sideways like Tarzan or something. I stood there for a minute. There was at least 20 feet between us, but I was still being very cautious. The entire encounter had me on edge. As from what I'd heard, the sky was a little bit unpredictable. That's when I noticed the strange position that he was standing in. His arms were outstretched over his head, kind of bent outwards, and he was balancing on one foot with the other bent up at the knee behind him. I started to get uncomfortable as he wasn't moving at all and almost seemed to be looking right past me. I took a step forward, but at an angle. Sure enough, his eyes didn't move at all. He was looking off into the wilderness with this almost emotionless face. There was just a touch of a grin on his lips, and I could tell because he had this goatee kind of thing going. I could see where his hair bent around the lips. I don't know any other way to describe it other than it looked like he was pretending to be a tree. That man was beyond still, I can't describe it. If he'd been standing there for any decent length of time, his muscles should have been rattling like a sheet in the wind, but nothing disturbed him. At this point, I crossed a little clearing. I got within five or so feet of him. I was gently talking to him the whole time that I approached, trying to make it clear that I didn't mean him any harm. He never moved. 
Once I got that close, I kind of freaked myself out again, so I just stayed put for a minute. Devin had still not looked at me, and for some reason that creeped me out more than anything. I actually turned back once to see if there was something that put him in shock, and of course there was nothing there but trees. I said his name again, waved a hand in front of his face, nothing, not even a blink. Just as I was getting ready to turn around and get back to a comfortable distance, the unthinkable happened. His face moved. For a brief moment, the little grin turned into a half smile. His eyes flashed over and looked directly into mine. My skin turned to ice and I backpedaled as quickly as I could. This guy was totally aware of me and maybe even trying to lure me in close. Hey, are you okay? There's a lot of people looking for you. I explained. Your truck is parked just at the bottom of the hill. But he went still again. But that half smile remained. He gave me one more flickering glance and went back to pretending to be a tree. I could no longer handle it. I needed to get the hell out of here. I said that I'd bring help back the second I got to the trailhead. And with that, I turned and started marching west. Maybe a little southwest. I was moving instinctually just to get away from this guy. I didn't get more than 50 feet before I heard something. Something other than my own breathing and my own heart slamming into my ears. I held my breath for only a second before I placed it. It was another voice. It was coming from behind me. I turned back and guess who it is? Devin Williams, muttering something from his tree pose. At this point I'm committed. I can't leave this guy if he needs help and by the sound of it he's changed his mind. I start walking back into the clearing to better hear what he's saying. It's total nonsense though, indiscernible gibberish. There was something about it though, a weird kind of cadence, a rhythm. This may or may not be important later. I didn't get any closer because I didn't need to. This guy was nuts and proving it in real time. He wasn't making any sense. So I returned to the original mission, bring folks more qualified to deal with this. I was a good two or three hours from the truck still and needed to start putting some ground behind me. I'm going to be back in a few hours, so please just wait. I said before I was interrupted. Devin started to move as I spoke. He reached into his pocket and threw something at me. Still to this day, I don't know what it was. It could have been a rock, a wallet. I have no clue. I stepped backwards so quickly I tripped myself up and fell down. As I was falling, Devin flashed that crazy smile. My ass hit the ground and Devin started running at me. Now my adrenaline had purpose. I jumped up and started sprinting through the trees. My gear was tight, ready for quickness, and my boots were literally built for this. I took a peek behind me and saw that he was still chasing me, arms pumping all crazy, eyes going wild. It was something out of a horror movie for sure. My assumptions about his bare feet were correct, as he couldn't keep pace with me for very long. I ran for about a quarter of a mile, which was nothing for me as a trail runner. After that, I couldn't see him behind me, but I could still hear something moving around in the brush. I kept going at a jog, but after a while decided to conserve my energy. This guy might be crazy, but he certainly isn't magic. I walked the rest of the way at a pretty good clip till I stumbled back into the parking lot from the total opposite side. I'd overshot a little bit, but used the terrain to guide me right back to the truck. There was no one there, so quickly packed up and tore back down 300 Road. I knew there would be search and rescue, Healish County Sheriff's somebody to tell. It's sundown at this point and starting to cool off. I want to relay the message as quickly as possible. Sure enough, I see a group out in the woods, maybe a quarter of a mile. I stopped right there in the road and hopped out of my truck so fast that I left the door swinging open behind me, yelling, waving my arms, and then I raced over to them. Within 20 minutes, I told the story to both search and rescue and law enforcement. Everyone was rapidly showing up to our location and pressuring me to lead them to where I found him. I was exhausted at this point and a little shocked that they would make the request of me when I could just as well show them on a map but my gear and clothing probably gave me away as a decent hiker. So I did what they asked of me and humped my way back up the hill, the short side, the way I descended. 
The guys lit up the area in every direction with headlamps, flashlights, all kinds of cool stuff. Naturally, nothing turned up on the return journey. We got all the way to the clearing, or as near as I could remember, and there wasn't a trace of him. I made an official statement with the sheriff back at the parking lot where I was allowed to start the long drive back home. I never got a return call or any follow-up information, but I did learn more details later on my own. There was a story a couple told about coming across Devin the day before I did, and we were officially the last people to ever see him alive. They came across him on the side of the road in their car and asked him if he needed help. From what they said, Devin acted much the same, standing rigid, talking nonsense to himself. Then he said it was time to light the grill and began striking a $20 bill with a rock. The couple got a little closer in their vehicle, asked him if he needed help again, at which point he grew agitated and threw the rock at their car. They drove off and Devin chased them for a moment or two. It was almost the exact same encounter that I had. Now to the muttering sounds that I heard, it had a cadence and a pattern to it but I didn't hear anything that I would call comparable until a few years later. I came across something called the Sierra Sounds, which is a recording out of California by a guy named Ron Moorhead. Ron claims they are recordings of a Sasquatch, to which I don't personally believe, but the sounds themselves stood out to me. It was the same guttural sound that Devin had been mumbling, gibberish, monkey talk. Some people have called the Sierra Sounds the Samurai Chatter, as the cadence of their voices apparently reminds them of Japanese speech patterns. The recordings never reminded me of the Japanese. They remind me of old Native American language and dialects from all over the American Southwest. I'm not trying to make any kind of connection. I frankly don't buy into Bigfoot, but it is the most similar gibberish to what I heard that afternoon. Do with what you will, as I can tell you the man in front of me certainly wasn't an ape. The noises were similar and that's all I can say. Back in 1997, I worked as a bartender in a small town tucked into the foothills of the Mogollon Mountains. Two years prior, when I started the job, a crazy story shook the local communities. A truck driver had crashed his truck somewhere out in the forest, then totally vanished. The first few days, we all heard the same things, but going on for two weeks after he disappeared, people kept coming in with these weird stories, sightings of a guy being strange out in the woods. The first people to encounter him said he was distraught, but not aggressive in any way. He refused help from anyone that offered, explained that he was forced to do what he did and was headed to prison. He made no effort to detain anyone or coerce them in any way. He sounded harmless and confused, but we weren't there to see him. As the week went on, the stories got more and more wild, mostly with aggression. People that were running into him were getting things thrown at them, yelled at, all kinds of crazy stuff. Fast forward to 1997, early May. A string of hikers come stumbling into the bar. It's not uncommon for my neck of the woods, but this group looked different. Instead of tired and drowsy, they were wide-eyed and almost flighty. They plopped down to the bar and ordered a round of beers. They were talking amongst themselves as I poured, and when I went to serve them, I made a joke that opened a can of worms, so to speak. You all look like you just saw a ghost, I said. They all went pale. Slowly, after a sip of beer, they spoke up and told me about what happened. They went on a day hike just up the mountain, just north of Forest Road 300. It's a stretch of mountain service road that all the weekenders used to camp, shoot, fish, and hike. Apparently, these guys were hiking a pass from one service road to the other, which were splintered roads off 300. Apparently, halfway through their trek, at the bottom of a gully, they stumbled upon the top half of a skull. In complete disbelief, they almost left it behind, but decided to leave a person with it instead. That way, there was no missing it when they came back with the deputy. They got to the nearest phone and called the sheriff's department, who came out to collect it. The hikers weren't aware of the missing trucker to my knowledge, so probably weren't really looking for him. The sheriff told them about Devin Williams and the tragedy that occurred when he disappeared. From what everyone knew, Devin was a stand-up family man 
who went any distance to provide for his family, literally. He had a wife and kids, a house he just bought. The more that came out, the sadder it became. And now it was over, from what these hikers told me. Case closed, as they never found a trace of him over those two years. His truck was removed, as was any and all evidence of him in the area. His skull was the last thing to ever be found out there in the rim. It wasn't until a few months after those hikers came in that we all started to hear the details. The dental records were a match. It was 100% Devin Williams. Some people weren't convinced at first, but now it was undeniable. The strangest thing was that his skull was clean and totally undamaged, zero trauma. Considering it had been out in the elements for so long and almost certainly scavenged upon, I didn't understand how that could even be possible. There was a lot of buzz with theories, and one of the biggest had to do with the gas station drugs that were commonly used by truckers. This was the 90s, so I'm sure you remember some of these little pouches of pills that were behind the glass or just hanging under the counter at the convenience stores. They'd be called Leopard Jazz 5000 or Wild Night Steam Engine, with some crackpot advertising reminiscent of the Animorphs cover. These pills were sold as energy pills, but were literally known to be legal speed. They'd crank your heart rate, make you grind your teeth if you took enough of them. We had truckers blow through town all the time, and half of them were hooked on some kind of stimulant. That being said, everything we heard about Devin contradicted this. He worked for a reputable trucking organization out in Kansas, so got regularly drug tested. He never once failed or refused to take one. He was just known as a level-headed guy with no history of drug abuse or any mental illness. There was another theory that actually hit the headlines in the Arizona Republic. Frankly, I was astonished at the idea. There had been a flap of UFO sightings around the rim that summer of 1995. Someone put two and two together, said maybe Devin had been abducted. There was and still is zero evidence to support this, but I think the Travis Walton case still lingered in some locals' minds. Walton, of course, was the logger who vanished in 75, and not far up the road by any means. When his skull turned up, that UFO theory was out the window. The only other logical thing I've ever heard was maybe he had a diabetic episode and went into some kind of psychosis. Even then, he had no history of diabetes, and was going into such a delusional state in just one episode doesn't sound logical to me. Then again, I'm a bartender, not a doctor. I just hear what hikers come through and tell to me. I'd like to start this by saying that Devin Williams is by all means a good, innocent guy. I don't think he meant to hurt anybody when he had this episode. Something uncommon happened to a common man, and he wasn't fit to handle the issues that arose. As the stories from all the witnesses show, Devin had no history of drug use. He was actually called into his trucking headquarters regularly to keep them updated in regard to route and arrival times. Not once did he sound under the influence in any way, shape, or form. He was a hardworking individual and shouldn't be seen as a psychotic or ill-intentioned person. I've never met the guy, but I've done a lot of deep diving into his case, so that's all I have to say. The disappearance of Devin Williams has always been mysterious to me, partly because I live only 30 miles from where the incident took place. Like stated previously, Forest Road 300 is a high traffic area for what is widely considered the wilderness. I grew up camping along the mountain ridge and overlooking the valley below. It is the last place a reasonable person would drive a semi truck. I remember hearing about Devin first in a YouTube video, then later in an episode of Unsolved Mysteries. I remember hearing the location and turned to look out my window. The trees that I could see would eventually lead me to the same trees that those hikers found his skull in. The same trees that shrouded his missing semi from the rest of the world. It was unbelievable that one of these cases happened so close to home. I heard about him in 2018 and planned my first venture into the area not long after. I acquired the alleged coordinates from a local contact and framed my exploration around that. This is what I can tell you after seeing the area firsthand. It is gridlocked with pine trees, so overgrown that it blocks a lot of line of sight between the areas, especially with terrain changes. Devin was wearing dark clothing and was partially evading other people, 
based on available reports. He had no interest in receiving help or communicating at all. The tree and brush cover would be sufficient for a person to stay out of sight for extended periods of time. His behavior is absolutely in line with psychosis. The part that stands out most to me is the act of striking a $20 bill with a rock. It reminds me of people hallucinating on LSD or mushrooms. The thought is there. I can almost see the pattern he's trying to make, but all of it is disconnected from reality. Time to start the grill. He attempts to make a fire. Okay, not the craziest connection. It tells me that his brain was firing as if in a dream state. Like the bartender, I'm not a doctor, but I've dealt with psychosis in family members, and that kind of behavior totally fits the bill. This is what I believe happened after he crashed the truck, because no amount of research will ever solve what happened up until that point. However, after he crashed, we know he wandered around the clearing. He spoke to people in the area about being forced to drive off the road and that he was going to prison. Devin knew he was in the wrong with his actions, so was still operating with a little reason. I suspect that his delusions of being manipulated by some unseen force and the looming threat of going to jail devolved into a deep, deep paranoia. As that took over his psyche, he retreated into the Tonto forest in a state of disconnect, like when he was driving that truck. I don't believe Devin really knew where he was. He may have been seeing something else entirely, which would account for his reckless actions behind the wheel. People reported that he didn't react to them waving or standing in the road, like he literally couldn't see them. Psychosis can make a person think that they're in a totally different place than where they really are. Over the next few days, Devin wanders around the mountainside, having his brief encounters with hikers here and there. These encounters probably reinforce whatever insane paranoia his brain is cooking up, further diluted by the starvation setting in. The lack of food likely contributed to his irritated, irrational state of mind. A random piece of knowledge is this. Depending on the seasonal temperatures and rainfall, a variety of mushrooms are known to grow in this area. Many of them are toxic, very few are edible, and a select few will send you into hallucinations. And of those, several can kill you during those hallucinations. It's possible that Devin ate some of these during his days in the wilderness, and further deepened his mental hole that he found himself in. This is all pure speculation, but might account for some of his strange behaviors shortly after disappearing. As time went on, Devin likely got more desperate. The area that they found his skull in, and where he was sighted before that, has a lot of jagged ridges. There are several cliffs and drops in the ground where an unsuspecting traveler could fall to their death. I believe that Devin was walking around at nighttime, navigating the area in the dark, took a spill over one of these cliffs, and that might explain the undamaged nature of his skull, especially if he landed feet first. After that, animals would have gotten to his corpse and scavenged it. Bigger critters like mountain lions and coyotes could actually drag the body parts for several miles. I think the roundness of his skull helped it roll to the bottom of the ravine during a good rain, and the rest of his body was dispersed through deeper wilderness. There were probably bones in dens, caves, up in trees, the larger deposit hidden somewhere under a blanket of leaves and pine needles. This is the most logical explanation that I can come up with. This has been a missing 411 story. It has its inexplicable factors, and many take those at face value. I am a long time. I'm a long time local, so I've heard all the stories about creepy things that live in the woods. For Arizona, skinwalkers definitely sit at the top of the list. You can take all of this as complete speculation, but I'll share the most out there theory that I've ever heard. It's a little known fact that Tonto means dumb, moron, or fool. It gets used in a lot of pop culture as a native name or term of endearment but it's actually something of an insult to many early tribes. This might be meaningless, but there is value in what early people named things. Look at Iceland and Greenland, an old and commonly known example of culture using to a name to trick outsiders. This was explained to me by a forest ranger. It's fitting that the forests around here are named Tonto, the last gift from the tribe that the settlers ran off or executed. It's like gifting a house to your enemy at 666 Haunted Avenue. The warning is in the label. It rides the idea of a sacred native land. What better gift for your conquerors than a cursed wilderness 
with a fitting name to boot. Come live in the big dumb forest where you can be haunted always. The theory is this, something thought it would be funny to confuse this trucker as he drove through Tonto Forest and divert him off course. He finally crashes the truck and disappears, only to be spotted all over the side of the mountain for the next week. He's making weird sounds, making no sense, and he doesn't know how to be human. The joke would be the cargo. What a moron for leaving so much fresh produce out in the middle of nowhere. It was explained to me that the cargo was potentially a sacrifice for the tribes long lost in the area. They played a little joke and in exchange got to scare the communities living atop their bones and harvest sweet fruit for their afterlife. There is even a town called Strawberry just 25 miles where Devon Skull was found. This was a theory that I heard in a bar one afternoon many, many years ago. I don't put much stock in it, but because this is missing 411, I feel like some of the information is worth mentioning. Ultimately, only Devon's skull was found. I still go out periodically to see if any more of him can be found. Whatever diverted him off course that day, I hope I never encounter it. <laughs>